right. Well, so we'll go ahead and kick this off. Um, we are excited uh, today for this webinar. Um, so my name is Jennifer Hurst-Wender, and I'm Preservation Virginia's Director of Museum Operation and, and Education. And I hope that everybody who has signed in today is, is doing well. It's a beautiful spring day here in Virginia. And so thank you for spending your, uh, your lunch break with us today. So this webinar is a part of a series of educational programming organized by Preservation Virginia. Um, I encourage you to visit our website to explore more webinars about John Marshall and his home, as well as, uh, as, well as our other historic properties and programs. Today, as we examine the intricacies of the Rhodes Conservation, I would like to acknowledge our panelists, Leah Lane, Preservation Virginia's Curator of Collections, and Howard Sutcliffe, Principal of River Region Costume and Textile Conservation, for whom you are all here to see today. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so probably by this time, most of you are pretty used to webinars, but for those of you who aren't, you'll notice that there is a chat box. And we would love it if you could write in the chat box to let us know where you're tuning in from today. Um, we're so fortunate that in this digital age, um, our participants can join us from all over the world. And we appreciate knowing the distance that our programs travel. Um, and we'd also like to know how many people are viewing this program along with you. Are you watching by yourself? Um, are you with friends, colleagues, or family? Just let us know. So to keep to our timetable today, we're going to hold all of the questions to the end, um, but we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A block um, at any time during the program. And our panelists at the, end, at, at the end of our presentations will respond to as many questions as time allows. Uh, we're also going to employ the chat box to share links with more information. Uh, especially about the conservation effort and how you can safely visit the John Marshall House to see the road in person. So this session is being recorded um, and it will be available in the next few days. Okay, so let's get down to business. So since 1911, Preservation Virginia has maintained and interpreted the John Marshall House to share the great Chief Justice's life and legacy. We are grateful to the many descendants who have, over the years, returned furnishings, paintings, books, tableware, and personal items. These objects bring the rooms alive, and it doesn't take much to imagine the activities of family, the enslaved household, and the many guests who visited the Marshall's home. Now, there is no artifact that, best def that better defines Marshall's judicial career than the robe that he wore for his 34 year tenure as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. The robe was cared for by generations of descendants before finding its way into our collection. Now the robe is a witness object and if robes could talk, what a story this one could share. John Marshall wore this robe as he presided over 34 years of Supreme Court cases, during which time the Supreme Court was elevated to an equal branch of the federal government. And today, the simple black robe is a recognizable icon of the American judicial system. And as our curator of collection, Leah Lane put it, this iconic image of the American judge has been carried on by everyone from Chief Justice John Roberts to Judge Judy. <laughs> Stories from its construction and tailoring to the time it spent traveling to Raleigh as Marshall rode the circuit from the days war and hearing arguments before the court, cases like Marbury versus Madison, which is perhaps Marshall's most significant precedent, judicial review, asserting the court's power and authority to interpret the US Constitution. And stories of more mundane activities like hanging on a peg in the old Supreme Court chamber inside of the US Capitol, along with the robes of the other justices to the loving care received over the years of curation by family members and Preservation Virginia staff. And so to quote our CEO, Elizabeth Castelny, this object evokes the story of the early years of the court and represents the tensile strength of the experiment in American democracy. We were able to successfully conserve this icon of our nation because of people like you. And many of you are joining us today. Uh, your contributions to Save the Road campaign have helped to ensure 
that the road has been stabilized and environmental factors are controlled to slow future deterioration. So thank you. Now our work moves to the next phase. And so we uh, are providing ongoing educational programming at the house, both physically and digitally. And so we welcome you to learn more by visiting our website. Now, it's my honor to introduce you to Preservation Virginia's Curator of Collections, Leah Lane. Now, don't hold it against her, but she's a Kentucky native. Uh, Leah graduated with a bachelor's degree in history from the University of Virginia, and she earned her master's degree from the Winotor Program in American Material Culture. Leah joined Preservation Virginia at the very end of 2019 from the Cincinnati Art Museum. And since that time, Leah has led Preservation Virginia's historic sites through some of our most unusual times, as she simultaneously learned and managed our extensive collections through the pandemic and leapt into digital programming with grace and skill. So with that, Leah, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Jen. It's been an amazing year and some change now. Um, so I am so happy that you guys have joined us today. Um, this robe was one of the first projects that we launched into when I started and it has been brilliant to watch it come to fruition. So I'm gonna share my screen. Sometimes this takes just a second, so bear with me. All right, here we go. All right, now Preservation Virginia has cared for John Marshall's judicial robe for 108 years now. It's 108 years as the core object in our collection, 108 years of frequent display, and 108 years of unintentional damage from caring about this fragile garment so much. So why do we care? Why bring in the care and exceptional skill of someone like Howard Sutcliffe to stabilize this rather crunchy silk survivor? So before I pass things on to Howard for a full exploration of how he accomplished that feat, I think it's worth considering this question and looking at the history of the robe. So this is the story that has been repeated throughout the 20th century. When Marshall assumed his role as Chief Justice in 1801, the justices wore brightly colored robes. Marshall began the practice of wearing a simple black robe, promoting a sense of impartiality. And this became the image of the American judge that lives on today. Marshall's robe, this robe, is the iconic root of that tradition. So like many good stories, it's a bit more complicated than that. In two weeks time on May 19th, I encourage you to join in for our next webinar, uh, which will feature Matthew Hofstede, who I saw is on our attendee list, so hello. <laughs> uh, Matthew is the Associate Curator of the Supreme Court and has just published a groundbreaking article on the topic of how judicial uh, robes changed in time He's been working on this for over 20 years. And it calls into questions a lot of the assumptions that we made about the Supreme Court in those early uh, formative Republic years. So please don't miss uh, the next webinar on May 19th. And I don't wanna steal Matthew's thunder. So suffice to say, <laughs> the shift from colorful to black robes was probably less about symbolism and more about good old fashioned practicality. The first Chief Justice, John Jay, initiated a very elaborate design for the Supreme Court Justice's robes. And it's shown here in this portrait by Gilbert Stewart, as well as his surviving robe, which is at the Smithsonian. And this is the oldest surviving judicial robe. Um, ours is one of the very few that does survive though. Now this is described in the period as party colored and that's not party, that's partly colored. Um, and as justices rotated off, including Jay, it was really difficult to match these rather unique garments. Black is comparatively easy to procure and to achieve a sense of uniformity. So probably not a symbolic move and we think it had already happened by the time that Marshall took, um, took the helm of the court in 1801. And it's not like black robes didn't already exist. They had been in use even in England, especially in lower courts and by lawyers. In the United States, some late 18th century judges donned dark silk on the bench. Marshall was a student of George Wythe, who's in the portrait there at the top left. Uh, Wythe was a prominent Virginia lawyer and statesman. And we know that Wythe favored the black robe look. In 1772, he ordered from merchant John Norton in London, quote, 
a robe such as is worn by the clerk of the House of Commons, but better than the one that I had for Mr. Child, which indeed was scandalous. I could not figure out what was so scandalous about the first robe, but a black robe is customarily worn by the clerk and hopefully it was a less scandalous choice for Mr. With. And I haven't pinned down the exact moment when Marshall starts getting credit for bringing the black robe into our national iconography. But I suspect it was in the early 20th century, uh, perhaps around 1901, when the centennial celebrations of his appointment as Chief Justice um, inspired a flurry of newspaper articles and speeches and dinner parties like this one here that was held in Cleveland. It's a program from it. So regardless of its veracity, the icon of the martial robe has taken on a life of its own. These are just a few quotes from Supreme Court justices. There is power in the symbolism and in the story. After all, as Jen mentioned, Marshall did define the powers of the court and he insisted on uniformity in other ways. For example, justices lived together in boarding houses and they mostly issued unanimous rulings. So whether or not he actually instigated the use of black robes, he's totally in keeping with his approach to jurisprudence. So turning from the myth of the object, let's look at the object itself. Marshall may have had more than one robe over the course of his 34 year term on the court, but this is the only one that survived. And there's nothing that really points to a particular date within those 34 years in terms of construction or materials. And the only unusual aspect of the design are the sleeves. The folds and pleats and gimp are on the reverse rather than the front which is what you would expect on a robe of contemporary date. Now, whether or not this was a mistake by the original maker, it's clear that it didn't bother Marshall as the robe shows signs of use. And to the best we can tell, not a, no attempts to amend that design. Perhaps it was a personal preference. We just don't know. And as for those signs of use, the wear on the hem, the sweat and the pomade residue around the collar, they underscore the fact, as Jim said, that this is a witness object. It was president, it was president. It was present on historic and normal moments. Um, Marshall inaugurated five different presidents on nine occasions. And the press often noted his black robe up there. He donned them for portraits like this one, which is my favorite by Chester Harding. It shows it in its full glory. And of course there were the cases. This robe was witness to critical rulings like Marbury v. Madison, but also great injustices like Marshall's repeated denial of African-American freedom suits. We don't know exactly where the robe went after John Marshall died in 1835, but it likely passed to his daughter, Mary Marshall Harvey, who inherited most of his Richmond property. Although she owned the John Marshall house, which is marked in green on the map, um, she and her household lived a few blocks away um, down where you see it marked in red. And the robe was probably stored at that location for a period of time. Now, the next time we have a confirmed sighting of the robe is 1888. Annie Fisher Harvey, one of Mary's daughters, so one of John Marshall's granddaughters, uh, loaned the robe to the Virginia Agricultural, Mechanical, and Tobacco Exposition, say that six times too fast, um, which had a relics and antiquities section. And by 1892, Annie and her sister Emily were actually back at the John Marshall house living there. Uh, for years, it had been rented out to other families, but they were back um, in the family residence. Um, and one of their nephews, Dr. Hatley Norton Mason, recalled that the robe was tucked away in a pasteboard box in a cabinet in the parlor. Now, this is a picture of the parlor at about 1890. And um, we now interpret this as the small dining room with a family dining room space. And there in the far back corner, you'll see a couple doors. And I think that's the cabinet that he's referring to. So if you can see with your x-ray vision through that, those doors, then that's where the robe is. Um, Actually, Dr. Mason recalls how his mother draped, he's 12 years old at the time, drapes this robe over him and has him prance around the house. So add a little bit of aware that uh, Howard had to deal with. Now, the Marshall House was transferred to the stewardship of the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities, now known as Preservation Virginia, in 1911. And in 1913, the house opened to the public. And on that opening weekend, the star attraction was the robe on loan from the Harvey sisters. When Emily died in 1920, the robe became part of our permanent collection. 
Since that time, the rogue has been extensively exhibited and extensively conserved. One major conservation campaign took place in 1962, which took over 600 hours. Now, do you remember Dr. Mason, the little boy who's prancing around the house in 1892? Well, on the occasion of this 1962 uh, conservation campaign, he came back to the house and he put the robe on again. Um, <laughs> we did not try on the robe this time, uh, at least not the original. The robe has been exhibited in various spots around the Marshall House. It's generally shown on a mannequin and has traveled for exhibitions, including this one at the Smithsonian in 1967. The many years of display, exposure to light, and, and stress on the fibers caused by hanging has all compounded the inherent fragility of this remarkable object. Since 2005, so that's 16 years, it's been off view. It's only been pulled out for special events and for visitors. Here's uh, Jen, uh, who spoke earlier, uh, showing the robe to uh, Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor. In 2019, we started in partnership with the John Marshall Center for Constitutional History and Civics, the Save the Robe campaign to help support the conservation of this object. Now, thanks to the donors to this project and the work of Howard Sutcliffe, this robe can once again be safely and responsibly shared with visitors. It's my honor to pass it on to Jen, who will now introduce Howard. Thank you, Leah. Uh, there are a lot of photos in there that I don't think I have ever seen, so that's excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Howard Sutcliffe. Um, Howard is the Principal Conservator and Director of River Region Costume and Textile Conservation, which is a private practice in Arley, Alabama. Howard has previously worked as the Head Textile Conservator at the Detroit Institute of Arts and in the Textile Conservation Studios at the Philadelphia Museum of Art and American Textile History Museum in the U.S. and at the National Trust and National Museums Liverpool in his native U.K. He is a professional associate member of the American Institute for Conservation of Historic and Artistic Works and is the current board member of the North American Textile Conservation Conference and chair for the forthcoming 2021 meeting in Nashville, Tennessee. Howard received a Bachelor of Design in Constructed Textiles with honors from Duncan of Jordanston College of Art in the University of Dundee in Scotland. He received a postgraduate diploma in textile conservation with credit uh, from the Textile Conservation Center, Hampton Court Palace, in affiliation with the Courtauld Institute of Art and the Inter at the University of London. And he received a Master's of the Arts in Museum and Gallery Management with merit from the School of Cultural Policy, Civic City University, London. Um, so, Howard, it's an honor to have you join us. Welcome and thank you so much. And now I'll turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you, Jen. That all makes me sound really old, all that stuff. But let me share my screen. Uh, here we go. And then we will hit that. So hopefully you can all now see that. So, well, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Leah. Um, yeah, I had not seen some of those photos either. And um, it was really interesting to see the photo of um, Andrew Jackson's inauguration because I also worked on some artifacts from that that are in uh, Tennessee State Museum. So it'd be kind of interesting if uh, both the robe and Andrew Jackson's uh, top hat uh, were at the same spot at the same time. It's very cool. So, well, my involvement in this project um, goes back to January of 2019, uh, which seems a very long time ago now. Um, but I flew up to Richmond um, to basically spend a, a morning at the Marshall House um, examining the robe and um, just really kind of um, getting to grips with its current condition. Um, I don't think anyone had seen it for quite a while. It had been uh, boxed up and um, was just very, very fragile. And I think people were kind of reluctant to take it out. So I spent the morning kind of carefully um, 
unfolding it, uh, documenting its current condition. And um, after that, I wrote up a treatment proposal for, um, for Preservation Virginia. And um, that's basically a document that um, outlines um, the condition. And then it also uh, goes through what I suggest for the treatment step by step. Um, and gives, gives the client that all important uh, time and cost estimate. And um, so there was, uh, as, as Leah mentioned, there was a period of, of fundraising. And then um, we had quite a few dates on the calendar for me to drive up to Richmond to come and um, collect the robe. And various world events kind of took over last year. And uh, I eventually uh, made it up there in mid-June to um, collect the robe and then bring it back down to um, my studio uh, in Ali. And um, let's move on. And so these two photos basically show the robe front and back, uh, front on the left and right on the back uh, before conservation. And um, Basically, just to kind of run through kind of like a quick description, it's a very simple um, uh, construction. There's uh, two panels on the back, two smaller side panels, and then two uh, panels on the front. And then obviously you have a front and back on each sleeve. Um, they, the robe is made from a, a black silk satin and um, satin is a, uh, a warp faced fabric. So mostly the, uh, the warps are on the surface and uh, the warps are very fine. They're much finer than the weft in this case. Um, and the loom width, uh, it was an eight harness loom, uh, loom, I think that this was woven on and um, each panel of fabric is about two feet wide. So, the uh, panels are stitched together along um, their salvage edges and they are drawn together um, at the top. Now I'm just showing you, this is a, a photo that you'll see um, a little bit later on, but this is after conservation, but it really um, shows you very clearly those panels. And so you have, um, the two in the center back, the two um, differently sized small side panels and then the front panels. And um, it is really interesting that the, uh, the construction of the robe is uh, just a, you know, a little bit um, not exact, I think would be kind of like a, a polite term. Um, and so you can see kind of like with the back that the center back does not line up um, nice and flat. There's a lot of kind of excess material in there. The, the seams kind of like pull a little bit. So I think the thought is um, that the whoever kind of actually constructed these um, was maybe working from a description and maybe was not, you know, the most uh, uh, talented of seamstresses. Um, and obviously you then have the issue of the, the sleeves being on um, back to front as well. But um, all that fabric, because um, there's a lot of fabric there, um, is brought together around the yoke um, with what actually really is kind of like a tour de force of cartridge pleating. I mean, it's amazing how they've drawn all this fabric together to kind of fit it around the neck. And, and you can just see from these two photos that it is um, very, very finely done. Um, I'm not sure if you can see on the right hand image, the uh, tuck pleating, the knife pleating that's at the um, decorating the, the sleeve back there, but we'll move on to this next slide so you do get a good view of it. So those are just kind of like nice little uh, tuck pleats and they're held in place using uh, this twined silk wrapped cord gimp. And I think those, those uh, pieces of gimp are about two inches long each. And then there's a lovely just kind of uh, silk wrapped uh, wooden button at the end of each of those. And even in this photo, you can kind of start to see some of the, uh, the splits and the condition issues that the robe had. So, um, 
There were some interesting other little kind of um, construction things going on, particularly around the neckline. Um, there had been a panel added, um, almost like a collar that um, was obviously done fairly early on. It has, uh, it's in the same fabric as, as the rest of the robe. So it was probably um, contemporary to to uh, John Marshall and the creation of the robes, but it's added on almost as a collar, but it's asymmetric. And so it sits kind of like a little collar on one side and then it comes down as a, a panel um, all the way on the, on the proper left side there. Um, but that sets up the neckline for kind of like some tensions and um, it just kind of like makes the way that the robe lies on the body a little bit um, strange. So kind of, um, I don't know whether that was done because uh, he wasn't happy with the neckline or it got damaged and it was put on to kind of repair something. Um, I mean, there's a, a number of different reasons why that could have been done, but it was definitely a, a contemporary um, addition or repair um, to kind of like the early 1800s. So let's move on. And here is uh, a few photos of the robe. Um, which really shows some of the um, condition issues that it has. Um, so there's a lot of inherent vices going on here that kind of really contribute to um, its degradation over the years. So first of all, it's a, it's a 220 year old object. So it has, uh, you know, age going against it. Um, and considering it is 220 years old, it was actually, you know, amazing that there's so much of it that is left. But um, it is made, first of all, it's made from silk, which um, during, uh, and certainly during this time, um, would have been uh, subjected to a process called waiting. And so um, silk uh, is sold by the weight, certainly at this, at this point. And so when you start off with a little uh, silk cocoon, um, those are boiled down during that boiling um, and they're boiled down to kind of release the gum so that they can kind of like uh, collect kind of the monofilament thread. So during that process, um, a lot of the gum is lost and the gum is quite heavy. And so, um, to counteract that, uh, the dealers would uh, then soak those uh, threads in uh, a heavy metal solution. So kind of tin or chromium or something like that to impart the weight back. Um, none of those chemicals are great for the preservation of silk. And so um, they you know, contribute to uh, the general degradation. Um, you also have the satin structure going against it because you have, certainly with this one, you have kind of um, six, or oh, I think seven actually, um, warp threads crossing over every wear thread. So it's a little uneven. If, um, if it was a kind of a plain weave fabric with one weft crossing one warp, it would be uh, much more stable. And also those warp uh, threads are much finer than the weft. And so you have that difference in weight and you have kind of like uh, all those warps on the surface can be easily abraded or caught. And so they're quite easily damaged. Um, you also have the fact that it is dyed black. Um, and so at this time it's, possible that they used uh, iron gall um, dye, which would have been kind of incredibly expensive. There also would have been, um, I think it's probably more likely that it was dyed using logwood, using an iron tannic acid as the mordant. Again, none of those things are great for the preservation of the silk itself. Um, and then generally, with it just being silk, silk of, of all the natural fibers, silk is um, very, very susceptible to environmental damage, uh, such as uh, UV light and fluctuations in relative humidity and temperature. Um, the fibers can undergo a process called acid hydrolysis in the presence of UV. And so they basically just start to break down, become more brittle. And um, you'll see that kind of like, uh, splits and breaks just start to 
to uh, form, which you can see there on um, the center photo. Uh, what is happening in the center there is there's a lot of uh, breaks in the warp threads and you can just see the weft floats. Um, and again, you can see that in the, uh, the photograph on the, the right of your screen as well. Um, also, as, as uh, Liam mentioned, there's um, going to be kind of mechanical damage. Um, obviously, the rope was worn a lot. And so there's kind of um, contact with sweat, there's contact with you know, hair pomades and all sorts of things that were gonna be on the body at that time. Um, so none of those will really have helped. And also, just wear and tear through use. I mean, kind of there was damage certainly along the hemline um, from where it would have dragged along the ground, along the sleeves and the cuffs from where he would have been writing and resting on the rope um, during, you know, long days at court. Um, and so those, I mean, those are kind of like very nice, you know, uh, indicators of use and um, thing, you know, things that we really want to try and preserve to show that it was uh, an object that uh, received heavy use. And then another contributing factor to um, the damage that the robe received is also the fact that it has been displayed in the past and um, quite a lot actually. So, you know, hanging it, um, up and kind of like having it on a vertical display on mannequins um, probably, you know, haven't helped over the years, um, especially just where it's hanging. It's not particularly well supported um, on, a, on a mannequin. And um, let's move on. And then one of the major things that really I had to deal with was the fact that the robe um, has been uh, subject to kind of a lot of restoration and conservation work um, in the past. And so in these two slides, you can see the interior of the proper um, left front with um, numerous different campaigns of uh, support stitching that have been done there. So you have um, you have brown crepeline patches, you have black crepeline patches, you have um, areas where it's just kind of stitched to itself. You have kind of like some black silk organza patches there as well. And here are some more um, photos along those lines. Um, in the bottom left, you can see um, a small repair that's made using a, a silk ribbon. And then there's kind of like another patch of crepeline that's been added on top of that to, re, to um, reinforce that. There was uh, quite a few of those. And then in the top left photo, you can just see the very intense stitching um, that the robe underwent uh, during the 1962 restoration. Um, some of those areas, uh, there, there's kind of 16 uh, rows of stitching per inch. I mean, it's very, very intense. So I, the little fashion show there. So really the process, um, and to kind of like uh, take a sidebar here, um, another part of the, the project was actually to kind of create um, three replica robes. And so, the whole process really started with kind of mapping the robe, um, uh, really kind of uh, understanding its construction and um, working that all out. And so for the, for the robe reconstruction part of the project, um, I worked with my friend Ryan Blocker, who you can see there uh, in the red. Um, and Ryan is uh, the textile curator at the Alabama Department of Archives and History in Montgomery. And um, she is a, uh, a whiz um, kind of costume maker. And so uh, that is not my forte. So um, it was a natural choice to kind of uh, uh, recruit Ryan to kind of like help me with that. And so you can see um, it's been, you know, a, well, an eight month um, process, um, lots of meetings, kind of looking at samples and you can see one there of uh, the sleeve sample. Um, 
And we had, you know, obviously we had discussions of uh, what to replicate, what not to replicate. Um, and so, you know, we certainly kind of kept the, uh, the strange additions around the neckline and replicated those because they were, you know, contemporary to the early 1800s. Um, and uh, I, I, so Ryan pretty much made um, a, a, a complete kind of like trial run um, in a very fetching shade of blue polyester before um, launching into the very expensive black silk that the replicas are made of. So, um, and uh, so in addition to all of that, um, I, had, uh, I had worked with a lady, um, Cheryl, in uh, Maryland before on uh, another project where I needed reproduction buttons. And so Blue Cat Button Works in Maryland, um, made uh, the reproduction uh, buttons for the for the replicas and then um, we were having a hard time just kind of like figuring out trying to find um, replica gimp braid it's not like you can just walk into joanne fabrics and find um, you know this stuff on the on the peg and so um, eventually and it was completely obvious um, one of my very good friends in the UK, Anne-Marie Hughes, is a, a textile conservator, and she came into conservation from um, uh, a background in theatre, costuming and design. And um, she uh, really wasn't doing much last year because of the pandemic, because all of the museums uh, in the UK pretty much closed and are uh, still closed, just about to reopen. Um, and so she was sat at home kind of twiddling her thumbs watching daytime TV. And I'm like, I have this great project for you. And uh, so she was able to uh, make the reproduction uh, gimp braids and uh, ship them across. So um, the replicas have really been kind of a bit of a, a global affair. Um, and all the replica, all, all the silk actually came from uh, a mill um, in the UK as well. So, uh, the actual conservation process, and uh, we'll kind of work through some of these photos. Um, so the first thing that uh, we started, well, that I started out doing was uh, surface cleaning um, using low-powered vacuum suction. And that's basically a fancy way of saying that I vacuumed it um, using, using kind of like a, a very fancy vacuum. Um, but... Um, so everything was uh, was surface cleaned, and I was able there. I was also able to um, capture all the dirt and silk fibers that uh, came off during cleaning, um, which is something that's done fairly commonly in um, textile conservation. Um, maybe not super useful in this case, but we do it just out of practice. Um, it's done quite a lot with uh, certainly with. Um, archaeological textiles um, because you can looking at the soils and things that come off you can really start to pinpoint where textiles come from if their documentation is not great. Um, it's also done a lot with uh, American Civil War uh, pieces because um, you can uh, again kind of like pinpoint particular battlefields looking at the you know type of grass seeds or pollen that you kind of uh, can find um, in the dirt as well. So um, once surface cleaning had been done, um, I did a thorough evaluation of the um, previous repairs and then really figured out um, what was safe to keep. Um, I mean, the criteria was, was looking at kind of, um, are these repairs still doing the job that they were intended for and are they causing further damage? And so some repairs were uh, more easily dealt with than others. Um, all of that incredibly intense stitching um, from the 1960s uh, was very, very stable and removing any of that would have just done a lot more damage than good. So most of that stayed. Um, a lot of the patches, um, if the stitches were, were large, I was able to kind of remove those fairly easily or trim them down, as you can see with some of the, the brown patches there. And um, the, the patches along the hemline were, were all pretty clunky. And so I was able to kind of easily remove those as well and redo all of that. So there was just a lot of kind of like cutting and clipping and just kind of pulling threads out um, for, for many days. 
And then after that, the uh, the robe was humidified, um, which is something that we really do just to kind of like impart some uh, water vapor into the fibers just to improve their condition. And um, with this, um, it was great because the robe is, you know, pretty much nice and flat. So I can use kind of Gore-Tex sheeting. Um, so Gore-Tex we're all familiar with from kind of, you know, winter coats, it's a semi-permeable membrane. So you wet it on one side and then it's dry on the other and you lay the dry side against the textile and the water, uh, the moisture just kind of like uh, slowly wicks into um, the fabric underneath, into the silk. So it's a very controlled process. Um, and it's basically, uh, it was just going from panel to panel to panel doing this. And so you can see kind of on the, um, on the right hand of the screen there, I was, once the, each panel was humidified, I was then able to kind of realign everything and just get everything, you know, nice and flat ready for the structural support. And so um, the whole line, the whole robe basically, um, rather than doing uh, little patches here and there that had been done in the past, um, each, each of the panels were, were fully lined um, using a, a crepe silk organza, um, again from a, a conservation company in the UK. Um, and so here you can see me just kind of laying it out, measuring things and then cutting the selvages off. Um, Cause again, the selvages are quite tight. So you don't really, uh, you don't need those in place. And so those panels were pinned in place um, on the reverse just to hold everything. Um, and then the robe was turned over and you can see there on the right hand of the screen, I stitched in uh, grid lines, basically, that I was then able to follow for um, the actual support stitching. And um, if you look kind of in the, in the bottom right of that uh, image on the right, you can see that little darker area, which is one of those 1960s um, repairs that's just kind of like in credit. It's, I think I, it's, it's amazing. I, I mean, the time that it took to do all of that is, is insane, but I, it's so heavily stitched. And so here I am using um, these new stitches. And so to support all of the, uh, the damage, I used lines of laid thread couching worked and the threads that I used were um, silk threads pulled from the uh, from the organs of fabric. Um, and so they're very long stitches. Uh, you go from one from the top down to the bottom and then you come back up and kind of catch those uh, threads down um, every centimeter or so every half inch or so. Um, and it's basically um, it's just a very repetitive process and you're pretty much doing this over all of the um, areas of damage, certainly. And then um, in between those lines, uh, I used uh, another stitch, a staggered reverse running stitch, just to kind of hold the, um, the, the linings in place properly. And so here, these are photos of just gathering in um, the lining fabrics along the, along the yoke. And then again, repeating the process of uh, stitching all the damage along the sleeves there. And there we have the robe. You can just see kind of, you know, quite how big it is. Uh, my tables are kind of like 80 inches uh, long. So it's, it's, uh, it's quite, a, quite a large object and definitely filled the studio quite well. And here you can see kind of like around the, the outside of the objects, some of the, uh, the support materials that I haven't trimmed down yet. And then there we have uh, the, uh, the robe front after treatment. And here we have that interior shot again. Um, so most of, most of the interior was uh, completely um, lined. Um, along with the sleeves as well. Um, I did leave a panel there. You can see it on the left-hand side. Um, there was actually a, probably the area that was in best condition and didn't need any conservation work. So I left that bare just so that um, 
uh, in future kind of uh, researchers and scholars can actually see the back of the fabric um, without having to undo any conservation work. Here's the, uh, here's the back of the robe after conservation. And then the last uh, uh, stage of the treatment really was kind of dealing with the display. And so here I am kind of uh, using a, a very thin plastic, tracing around the edge of the robe to make um, basically the display pads. So we decided to kind of um, display the robe flat, a little bit splayed out, and then just to kind of pad it out slightly to give it a little bit of body. Um, and so the, the pads are made from uh, several layers of uh, polyester batting that are covered in uh, needle felt and then covered in um, a black cotton jersey. Um, and so the main body, as you can see there, looks like a weird manta ray. Um, there is also, uh, you can see in the background, kind of like a bunch of uh, long, you know, uh, black cotton stockinette sausages that filled various areas. And so there was, there was a lot of pads um, used to kind of like fill the robe. And there we have it loaded into its new case. And with the case uh, closed. So I will, and that uh, brings us to the end of my little uh, presentation there. So I'll stop sharing and then we can go back to Jen for questions. Thank you, Howard. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And I, I have to say for everybody who's listening, um, Howard was such a champ working with us. When he came to install the robe, we, uh, we really put him through the ringer with, uh, we had reporters, we had photographers, he did interviews uh, <laughs> and worked with us every step of the way to make sure that when we did install the robe into the case that it was safe um, and, and it was displayed exactly how it should have been. So, and you still came back to do a webinar with us. So thank you so <laughs> much, Howard. <laughs> Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you. Um, so we'll go ahead and get down to some questions. And it looks like one of the uh, most um, most the, one of the most commonly asked question um, is: Do we know where this the silk satin fabric was originally uh, made? I think at that time it was probably from the Far East. It was probably um, from China. Um, I don't know where it would have been dyed. I think kind of, um, it may have been dyed in China. I don't know. It's more likely to have been dyed kind of like at the point at where it was woven in Europe. Um, so at that point, logwood was coming out of Central America. Um, so, I mean, kind of like the nation of Belize um, was just founded because of uh, the logwood plantations there. So, um, so it's likely that, you know, you had this kind of like meeting of, you know, the raw materials coming together somewhere in Europe, uh, possibly, I mean, France obviously was a big silk center. There was also kind of Spitalfields in London and Macclesfield in the Northwest of the UK. Um, I mean, at that point trade was, you know, fairly kind of heavy between, you know, the fledgling United States and, uh, and the UK. So it, I suspect it was probably British. Um, but certainly the raw materials would have come from, from China at that point, because, you know. That's fascinating. That's where all this thought came from. I mean, Japan wasn't open at that point, so yeah. Um, so does that mean that the robe was likely um, constructed in, in Europe as well? Do we have any idea? I think that was probably done in the United States. Yeah. Leaning that way as well, in yeah. part because of some of the, the awkward construction techniques that were used. This was in London had, you know, if we go back to George Swift's ordering in 1772 through John Norton, that that robe from England, there were people who were specialized in that trade in England. Um, I didn't include it, but there's a wonderful um, trade card where it features all these images of robes. So there's they knew what they were doing. And I feel like whoever was making this in the United States was, as Howard said, 
maybe not as familiar with the form and maybe using it from a description. Um, and yeah, so beyond that, we don't really know. The, the original ones, um, I think Matthew will talk more about in terms of uh, where they came from, uh, Jay's very colorful robes. So I won't, I won't spoil all that. Yeah. Um, it is really interesting. There's uh, actually, I mean, it's a very common occurrence uh, in some of the later um, Native American pieces, um, certainly that I've worked on um, in Detroit, which has a great collection. And so you have instances of European style coats that were made by um, native makers who, you know, are more used to working with, you know, hides and things like that. And then they were kind of creating uh, garments out of trade, out of wool trade blankets and um, just kind of not as familiar with the materials. And so there's kind of like some really like, whoa, funky uh, construction methods and, and, and things. But I mean, so it's, it's interesting. It's maybe kind of like a similar thing that they were just working from, um, you know, either a description or kind of uh, an engraved image where you can only see one side of, of something and, you know, you're left to kind of deal with the rest of it out of your own imagination, so. We haven't found the smoke gun, gun yet, so we don't know. <laughs> it is interesting to look at the close-up of, of, um, of John Jay's robe and you do see that, that same stitching style in the sleeve um, that you see in Marshall's robe. All right, so it looks like we have a couple of questions about the conservation as well. So uh, Howard, you did um, an amazing job conserving it, but you know that it's going to need more conser conservation in the future. So what do you expect um, the next round of conservation is going to need to focus on? Uh, well, it, it's kind of interesting. I mean, um, one of one of the the main kind of ethoses of conservation is is really kind of trying to make things as reversible as possible. And so, you're kind of, there's constant improvements in uh, in techniques and materials. Um, certainly, when I look back at um, the conservation kind of uh, the description of what was done in 1962 when they, you know, they added formaldehyde and acrylic. There's certainly things that it's like, whoa, there's no way we would even think about doing, you know, things like that in the future, uh, you know, today. But um, hopefully, um, you know, this latest round of conservation will last for um, a long time. Um, I think a lot of it will be preventive conservation and kind of not moving it too much and just kind of, you know, making sure that uh, it is well supported and uh, well housed, you know, going forward, which it is. So, um, you know, I, I really, I really don't know. I mean, I think kind of the, the materials that we used um, this time around will last for a long time. Um, and so, there's going to continue to be, you know, a breakdown of the original silk. I mean, just during the install, as we saw, kind of every time you move it, there are little bits of, um, you know, kind of silk fibers that kind of break off and litter the case. And so, you know, we had to vacuum everything out very carefully before we closed the case. Um, so I think I think uh, going forward, you know, the the main the main problem will be kind of like care of handling and um, just making sure that it's uh, you know as, as stable as possible. Mm -hmm. Kind of delaying the inevitable, um, but hopefully we've delayed it a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so we designed a, a special case uh, for the robe, and we are Howard. Did you want to speak to some of the um, some of the features of the case that are going to allow the road to continue to be preserved as best as possible. Yeah, Howard, I'm happy to, to hop in on that. Um, sure. as, as Howard mentioned, you know, we really wanted to make sure that it, it could lay flat um, as, you know, putting it on the mannequin and hanging it was pulling on those threads and applying a lot of pressure on them. Um, so that's part of the reason why the case is very large. Um, it's about six foot by seven foot. Um, and very much dominates the, the gallery it's in at the John Marshall House, which I hope you'll come see. Um, so part of its scale is allowing it to have its room to spread out and not um, weigh on itself 
um, part of it uh, is the inserts that, um, that Howard designed. That also helps relieve pressure on the fabric itself. Um, everything that was put in there is conservation approved. You know, as Howard said, we're always finding new things about materials, but at this moment, it is top of the line. Um, and it's also sealed from the outside. So it's not, you're not getting a lot of exchange with the air in the room, um, which keeps out pollutants. Um, it also helps us keep a stable temperature and humidity. Um, there are, there's a material called a desiccants that are down in a, in a compartment inside of the case that also help us regulate the humidity level. Um, the, the glass itself is extraordinarily thick <laughs> and um, is uh, tempered and has UV protection built into it. Um, and light is, is one of the, the greatest threats to, to, to textiles. And so it's something that we paid a lot of attention to in the way we designed this case. Um, and um, so there is motion activated lighting inside of the case proper. Um, it's LED, it's at a low, f what we call foot candles. Um, uh, so it's at a low light level. And um, through all of those things and through keeping the room itself, a stable temperature, a stable humidity, keeping light out, we're doing everything we can to make sure <laughs> it is a happy, happy robe. Um, and you're absolutely right. It's, this is preventive conservation at this point. Was there anything else, Howard, that you can think of? That no, I think like pretty much covered it. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So this question is for Howard. Um, what part of the conservation process was the most difficult? Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of. Uh, there's always that beginning part of kind of, it's like, oh, I'm working on this 220 year old object that's kind of, you know, a one off type of thing. And so once you get over that kind of hurdle, and it happens with every project, um, you know, it's like, oh, um, once it's kind of formulating what you're going to do, and then um, once you kind of figure out that that's going to work, uh, you kind of relax and you can kind of, you know, get into it. But um, with this, it was really dealing with, um, it was so, it was great because, you know, you had large areas of the robot were nice and flat. And so those are easy to deal with. Um, once you're getting up towards kind of like the top and you're dealing with, you know, splits that are in those tiny little pleats um, that are very, very crispy, um, those are a lot more difficult to deal with. But um, once you've done, you know, one or two, you're then you're then good to go for the next two hundred that you have to do. Um, and uh, so that's yeah, it's always kind of like that, you know, tiptoeing into uh, the project that's kind of like the scariest bit, and then you settle down and um, you, you're kind of okay. But you always have in the back of your mind kind of the importance of what you're working on, and um, you know, you have to kind of keep pushing that pushing that away and trying not to think about it, so. Well, um, so we are just about out of time. Uh, thank you both for, uh, for your answers to our Q&A. Um, for anybody who has any additional uh, Q&A um, or questions that you would like to ask us, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, we will be happy to, uh, to answer as best we can. Um, so just to conclude, I, I did want to invite everybody um, on this program to be sure that you do make an, you are able to attend our new exhibit and you do get the chance to see the road uh, yourselves because there is no photo that's going to prepare you for um, the, the awesome experience of seeing the road in its new case. And so our exhibit is called Intended to Endure the Conservation and Legacy of John Marshall's Supreme Court Road. And we are open Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, and we have a few extended hours um, on Wednesdays and Thursdays right now. So check out our website. Um, you can book your tickets to see the Rogue online. We're still in COVID procedures, so we're still doing closed route tours. Um, but we hope to welcome you to the John Marshall House in the near future. And again, Howard, thank you so much. Uh, no, thank you. Webinar. It was a great project. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.